Um, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Tom Burson. Um, he's been in computer security for years. Um, uh, not as many years as I've been alive, though. So. <laughs> and um, he has, uh, I guess you're kind of a cryptographer at heart. I think so. Yeah, he thinks so. Um, and so he has done a lot of work in cryptography and cryptanalysis. Uh, he is currently the uh, chairman of the IEEE Technical Committee on uh, Security and Privacy. Uh, he has recently uh, been, are you the author of a book on C4I? No, I well, contributed to. Contributor. Yeah. And he's going to be talking about uh, some of the C4I issues and security uh, today. So we're running a little late at this point. We'll just get started. Okay. Thank you, Professor Irvin. It's up. It is on. All right, so it's a pleasure to be invited back here to the Naval Postgraduate School to speak again to a class of military leaders. My topic today is going to be involved with security for C4I, and I'm not going to talk about the, uh, the physical security of C4I, meaning hardening nodes, physically putting them in bunkers, having route diversity for communications and so on, because believe it or not, that seems to be fairly well under control. Instead, I'm going to talk about the information security of C4I systems. Uh, that is, the security of C4I systems against attacks in that part of the battle space, which is known as the as information space. And that, I'm sorry to say, is not under such good control and um, would benefit from some military leadership. And perhaps someday somebody in this room will be in a position to exert that military leadership and I'm sure it'll still be needed when you're in that position. So how did I get involved in this? I was on a committee of the National Research Council and I'll explain what the National Research Council is and uh, to study this topic and we wound up publishing a book which is here. Some of you will have seen it because it's being used here as a course, as a text in some courses. Um, I'll tell you later how to get your own copy of this book and I'll leave a couple here uh, for people. Let's go back to Abe Lincoln and the Civil War. So the Civil War was probably the first time when the commander in the rear um, was in daily, almost real-time contact with his commanders at the front. And Lincoln had a telegraph office installed in the White House, and he would go there in the morning, at noon, and in the evening. He would wor work his evenings there and often go back to the telegraph office after, um, after Mrs. Lincoln went to sleep and um, write his dispatches there and read to the front and harangue his generals that they should do more. Um, and he followed the war very closely. It was a very simple, um, very simple kind of C4I system, but he was the National Command Authority and he was talking to his, um, to his guys in the front. Now, Things have gotten a little more complicated since. Uh, <laughs> there'll be a quiz on this, <laughs> on this chart. This is a top level view, from somebody's point of view, of the integrated Air Force C4I systems. And this is a marvelous piece of work because um, the <laughs> the, in 95, this is a marvelous piece of work because it's possible to click on any of, these, um, any of these boxes or links and drill down into it where each one explodes into uh, further charts um, that, look, that look like this. So, um, so what's going on under the rubric of C4I has gotten lots more complicated in the 140 years um, or so uh, since Lincoln. And as you know, because you study these things, there are arguments that can be done about whether it, whether, whether it should be C4I or just C2, and whether it's C4I or C cubed I, and so on. And, you could, if you wanted to, spend three months, as our committee did, uh, arguing about what's in scope and what's out of scope, but I'm not going to address that here today. Now, another thing that Lincoln did in this time of the Civil War is he started this uh, National Academy of Sciences. And the purpose of the National Academy was to give advice to the President and the Congress on the uh, scientific advice, chiefly about the conduct of that war the Civil War or the war between the states, depending where you grew up. Um, where I grew up, it was the Civil War. Um, and they've been running ever since. And to their credit or detriment, 
they've never paid anybody since. So they call up and they say, hi, I'm the National Research Council. We're standing up a committee on C4I systems. Would you like to be a member? Said, Why should I do that? Who's going to be the chairman? What are we going to meet? What are we going to do? What's the problem? And so on. And they get people to actually serve on these committees for free. And they publish um, a lot of reports um, and make them available to the Congress, chiefly. And today, the National Academy um, is, is made up of the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Engineering, Institute of Medicine, and the National Research Council. Well, these are all bodies that people get invited to join if they do good, good and wonderful things in their fields. And it's an honor to be accepted by their peers. All the studies happen down here in the National Research Council. And they're often staffed by people who are members of various academies and also people drawn in um, from the outside. This is an inside the beltway uh, operation. These people are well plugged in in Washington. So Congress perceived that they had some kind of C4I problems. And apparently, they felt that the problems were that, well, arguably one-fifth of the military budget in 1998 was spent on systems that could be identified as C4I systems. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. Um, procurement cycles take a long time. Systems are often um, underperform when they're delivered because the problem, either because the system wasn't made to spec or because the problems moved, or both. Um, uh, the systems are very, very highly complex, and there's always questions about interoperability. It drives Congress crazy when somebody's sensor doesn't talk to somebody else's shooter. It actually drives them crazy. And that's what happened in the Gulf War um, in a number of ways. And the way that was explained to us was some problems associated with theater missile defense. We're trying to find the scud launchers, the tells. And so there were overhead national assets, both looking for tells and looking for launch plumes. And they would report back to Cheyenne Mountain. What do we call it now? Thank you. And so they'd report back there where, um, where analysts would look at it and have to translate the coordinate system from the sensor coordinate system to the shooter coordinate system, get on the phone, call the theater, and say what was happening in the theater, and, um, and either uh, sorties or uh, patriots would be tasked against the position of the tell. Well, this took a long time and was error prone. Um, and it drove Congress crazy. So they said in the 1996 Defense Authorization Act, they said the DOD shall contract with the NRC for a study of this stuff. And it's supposed to focus on, um, on inter service issues. Um, so the NRC decided to put together a committee. That was pretty interesting from my point of view, in that it consisted of not, it wasn't the usual suspects. There were some usual suspects. There are people from the defense industrial complex, the aerospace suppliers. There are a few of them in here. And they're marked by diamonds, um, except for these guys, right? That's the staff. But then also, they said, let's get some retired sinks and JTF commanders and have them on there. So they, I mean, these are actually the operators who have to use these systems. And so we wound up with a bunch of three and four star recently retired people um, who are marked by stars. Uh, Dave Maddox, Paul Miller, uh, Carlo Berry, who had been the CIO of the Air Force and whose chart that was that I showed you earlier. <laughs> and, um, and Bob Reed, a combat pilot with something like, you know, thousands and thousands of hours of, of combat flight time. And also, technologists who aren't working in the, um, in the defense industrial complex. And I marked us by these kind of open, open X's, the open, open crosses here. So the idea was that the military people were supposed to teach the technologists what the military problems are. The technologist was supposed to teach the military people what the technology um, problems and opportunities were. And they were all supposed to sit down and write a report. And the guys who work in the MI complex were supposed to keep us real about, um, about the, what, it, what it takes to build, assist, build and supply a system. It actually worked very well. 
and uh, it actually worked very well. And people, um, some committees I've been on have deteriorated into lots of arguing and um, about small points. And this one didn't. This one, people rapidly build up respect for one another on the different sides of the table. And also, people began to take portfolios about what, what it was they were going to cover in this report. And I decided, well, along with my colleague Dick Kemmerer from the UCSB, um, that uh, we would take the security portfolio, which is why we were invited on the thing to begin with anyhow. And everybody let us do that. Mostly we ignored Congress and did what we wanted to do, which was, um, uh, which was to go and get briefings and go visit places and sit around and work and come up with our report. The best things we did, to my mind, were going on site visits. I mean, we visited Norfolk and went aboard a number of platforms, um, including the Mount Whitney, which is a flagship of the Second Fleet, and the Atlanta, which is a submarine, and Stennis. And we went to Fort Hood um, in Texas and sort of Force 20, Army's Force 21. We went to uh, visit an exercise in Korea called Ulchi Focus Lens, which happens every year, year after year after year. Um, I'm sure we went other places to Hanscom Air Force Base. I'm missing out a big one, NSA. But, oh, and a blue flag exercise at Eglin Air Force Base, Florida, um, which was a real eye opener to me. So, so Ultra Focus Lens was like a fixed adversary in an all time well studied position, and the blue flag exercise was like something that had never been seen before, and how are the C4I systems going to respond um, to that? One problem about C4I area is that, you're not supposed to read this, um, is that what we're going to make yet another C4I report. This area has been studied and studied and studied in the Defense Science Board and MITRE and the Joint Staffs and, and the GAO and everybody constantly comes out with streaming reports because Congress is always unhappy and they always say let's make reports on this. And, um, and inevitably, these reports wind up with very small audiences stuck away in some file drawer and forgotten, except by the next group that's going to study it, which comes out and looks at it again. And so you know those guys were right about that. Um, we decided, we had a discussion about whether we, whether we were going to produce yet another C4I report that would be filed and forgotten. And we decided we didn't want to do that. If we, if, if we could avoid doing that, we would avoid doing that. And so instead of getting down to the details of some uh, or like joint stars radar or something like, uh, like that, that, down into the little details. We would try to stay up um, at, at a higher altitude and deal with, um, deal with issues that were persistent issues and which would exert a lot of leverage for a long period of time. So hopefully give our report um, a useful time on the shelves of people who, um, who would have it. Uh, I don't know yet whether we've succeeded uh, in doing that, doing that, but we discussed it explicitly and decided um, that that's what we would do. This is going to sound like preaching to the choir. Um, does any of this need to be said here? No? Good. But yet, this is part of what the, uh, what the military folks had to teach the technologists on the committee. They also had to teach us this. Anything need to be expanded on? No, I didn't think so. What we had to teach them was that everything changes, including the rate of change, which is only which is only accelerating. Uh, uh, processor speed, memory capacity, storage capacity, communications, bandwidth, and connectivity increase roughly following this Moore's Law stuff, where, um, where it go, uh, goes by a factor of 10 every five years, which is a factor of how many every, t every 10 years? Multiple choice. How many people choose 20? How many people choose 100? Yeah, factor of 100 every 10 years. Well, you'd be surprised. <laughs> you'd, you'd be surprised. So, um, and, 
And it's largely driven by the commercial sector, which is treating a lot of these assets as expendables. We treat a computer or a disk drive or a network link as an expendable. Buy it, use it, leave it behind. Does not get, doesn't get accounted for, it gets expensed. Well, never mind, you still have to expense it for the IRS. Um, and this is as opposed to a culture in the military which treats these assets as capital assets where they have to um, last a long time. Um, and, and there's a tension there. There's a tension between the necessity to, um, to buy and hold in order for training, in order to equip, it, equip an entire military. Um, uh, there's a tension between that sort of slow go, <coughs> slow change kind of culture and the fast change culture that are in the technological, um, that, that, that is being supplied by technology. Um, now it's true that most sectors of society are pretty heavily impacted by this rapid technological change that are coming. I mean, Walkman used to be hot and everybody has a Rio. And so people are going to have one of these Sony music pens uh, to listen to. Or maybe music eyeglasses. Who knows? Um, what's happening next. But the difference is, that's in the consumer grade, sumate, but in organization, in, in an organizational level, there are also organizations that ad ad adapt to and grok the new technology and use it as a business multiplier, and organizations that don't. So for instance, um, Deutsche Bank has often been held up as an organization that gets it and uses its financial information and the flow of financial information to be, um, to be successful in its marketplace, as opposed to, say, Wells Fargo Bank, um, just to choose one, which doesn't get it, and which uses information systems much the same way as they were used in the mid-60s. Um, in terms of logistics, uh, Kmart is often, Kmart or Walmart? Oh, wait, Walmart is often held up as an organization whose, whose logistics chain, I mean, goes from the ringing of a cash register right back to, the, to an order on a supplier's desk and who know every day how much of what was sold and where it was merchandised next to and what, as opposed to some other places um, like Lucky that don't get it. Um, so uh, whether or not you get, get it in terms of technology can make you a difference in the commercial or industrial area between being a winner and a loser. And also uh, places a high value on the skills um, which are in short supply, skilled people who are, who are in short supply. And it's a real problem f uh, in industry to gain, to hire and retain people who are good at information technologies. And it makes it a double hard problem for the military to retain people who are good at military technologies. I made a visit to West Point in November and the dinner time conversation was about how everybody, all West Point grads are getting out at five years. They're getting out when they can, they've been trained, they've had some rotation somewhere, and they're going for jobs in industry. And I'm sure that things like that are, um, face you all from time to time. It's tremendous difficulty to retain talented, information-oriented people in the military now. So it's true that exploiting C4I is very hard. And we try to tell Congress this. We say, look, industry has trouble exploiting C4I. So it's not, any, not surprising that the military also has problems exploiting C4I. And the problems in the military are additional. I, the military has additional problems beyond, um, beyond those faced by industry. Um, Without, I think almost, with, I think without exception, the military services of the United States are older than almost all industrial concerns in the United States and have deeper traditions of the way things are done. Uh, they're also very strong and generally prevail in traditional conflicts. And muscle is, is unmatched um, anywhere. However, uh, and also, we perceived in the committee that the, that the military faces information attacks at a level which industry is not likely to, um, to ever face them. I mean, I mean, there are capabilities, there are funded and trained capabilities on the adversary side whose intention is to, to, um, to, uh, to disrupt or control 
USC for I systems. It's often not the case in the industry. If there's something that happened in the industry, somebody would go to court. But, but in military operations, it's a fair thing to do. Also, C4I systems, well, any network tends to break down socioeconomic uh, organizational barriers. I mean, networks penetrate, um, networks penetrate barriers. That's one of the very interesting things about them. And as they do, old baronies, let me call them that, which depend upon the ownership and control of information are threatened by the potential for the f f free flow of information across the former, the former boundary. So, um, so systems that allow, for instance, a national censor to communicate directly to a Patriot battery um, cause a lot of problems for people who own everything in between because they're no longer in charge, as it were. I mean, they no longer have control over the flow of the information. It just flows. So um, the way the language that the guys in the committee used to do that is they said, well, that um, there are if it is that the is that C4I is horizontal while organizations are, are vertical, um, are sort of hierarchical. I mean, and it's true. Uh, the, org, the org chart of a military service is drawn as, a, as an org chart as a hierarchical org chart. Networks are drawn as clouds. Right? I mean, I've never seen yet a cloud labeled US Navy. Right? But I have seen a cloud labeled Cipernet. You know, so it's a very different way of, of thinking about things. Also, the DOD turns over its leadership very, very fast. Our perception is that the People in, uh, in command positions, C4I command positions in the Pentagon, don't stay in their post long enough to do anything or to get anything done, depending on which one um, we're, we're talking about. So there's, although the problem is persistent and sort of a thorn on the Congress's saddle, um, the, our perception is that the DOD is not providing consistent response to it. There's nobody in the Pentagon who's championing this. Well, I mean, there, there are champions here and there, including some in the Navy. But there's nobody like at the, at the, um, at the ASD, or Under Secretary of Defense level, who stays there long enough to get anything done. So after discussing this whole thing and deciding it, we decided on the committee that there would be three key challenges that our report would focus on in order for it to have uh, enduring value. And these were interoperability, which was the one Congress asked about, and which is very easy to see when it's not happening. And like I said, really bugs them. Um, information system security, hurrah. And DOD culture. Um, and, and the process, also the acquisition process, and the testing process, and the fielding process for C4I systems. That all comes under, under process and culture. And let me stop here to say two things. First is that I view that that's already a, uh, uh, a victory for the information security portfolio that I was holding, that I was able to get information system security on the plate of three things that this committee was willing to um, spend its time on and to put into its report. And the second victory is that it wasn't and security. I mean, we're sitting around one day talking, you know, and people say how security is, you know, the most important thing here. And I said, then why is it the last thing in the report? And they said, oh, we'll move that. So we got to be the middleest thing um, uh, in the report. You go back on those other reports that are listed, and you'll always find it's and security. So we managed to pump it up um, by one. Okay, the other thing I was going to say is I see some people taking careful notes. Um, thank you. I'm going to put the slides up on my website and give you a URL when it's over. So I should have said that um, in the beginning. Oh, I want to mention this. Um, uh, the eligible receiver exercise in 1997, everybody studied it? No? OK. It's a no warning, force on force exercise it happens every year. This particular year, it was a, you really didn't study this? They don't let you study things? Failures. Oh, I see. Well. <laughs> You know, <laughs> okay. So then you know something about it. <laughs> so in 
So this particular year, the idea was that a team would be tasked to attack the, the US, a US military team would be tasked to attack the US military um, information infrastructure. And depending on who you listen to, there were either 50 or 100 people on this attack team. And they spent either six or nine months preparing. They attacked over a period of two weeks. They got to a point where the operators in the Pentagon agreed that they had lost the option to respond militarily. Not because they couldn't communicate, because they had no faith in the integrity of the databases from which they would have to, uh, which they would have to rely on in order to, um, to plan their response. The only person who died, exercise died, in the whole exercise was a system administrator who was popped by some special forces when he was on vacation uh, on a Pacific island and, and who was tortured to reveal his sysadmin, his super user password. That was a key to the whole attack and he's the only fatality, only exercise fatality in the exercise. Um, yeah. So, is it easy to retain system administrators? No, it's not. It's a very, <laughs> it's, it's a very, very, it's a very, very difficult and responsible job, and one which is uh, is not appropriately, in the committee's mind, rewarded by the military reward structures. I mean, the guys who run the IT are not the same as the guys who fly the jet planes. It's, I mean, that's, that's the way it's always been, and that's probably the way it's always going to be. But to the extent that, that the C4I systems are the nervous systems that connect to the jet planes, um, the people who are running the C4I systems um, are playing vital roles in that mission. And the, the culture, uh, that's in the culture part. I'm not going to get into that much. But, um, but anyhow, this happened during, uh, during the committee during the time of the committee. So I had said to people at the beginning, security is going to be important. And they said, oh yeah, ha ha. Um, we'll listen to that and what. And they were sitting around talking, getting these briefs like from NATO and from all kinds of people, the, the, the special forces and the intelligence guys and the Marines and the Army and the Air Force and the Navy. And then comes in and gives it, this guy gives us this brief hot off the, hot off the presses. And everybody said, oh, maybe this security stuff really is important. So that's what helped in, um, in pushing security up onto the, onto the table and also up into the middle um, of the table. So in the rest of my talk, how much time have I used? 30 minutes. You're supposed to tell me after 20. <laughs> yeah, point of no return past 10 minutes ago. OK, so in the rest of my talk, what's left of it, I'm going to um, go through the findings uh, and recommendations on the security area of this report. Everything I'm going to say, well, not everything I'm going to say, but everything I'm going to put up um, can be found in the report. So we had two findings and seven recommendations. The first finding was that protection of DOD's information infrastructure is a pressing national issue, pressing national security issue. Protection, because we're deploying and depending upon these systems much, much faster than we're able to protect them. And so there's a gap between, between the protect mission and the fielding, and the, and the gap is widening. Things are getting worse in this area. First finding of the committee. And also, it's obvious that DOD is a target for information attack. And it was demonstrated, for instance, in the, in the, in the eligible receiver um, 97 exercise that this could happen. Second finding, <laughs> response has been inadequate to date. There's a lot of talk. There's not much action. Um, people don't take information defense seriously. OK, what does that mean? Um, blue flag exercise. It's a, it's a, it's a J, it's a, it's a JTAC. It's an air, it's an air control center, um, running an exercise war in the Middle East. There's blue team and a red team and a white team. The blue team, 
is trying their running Net Ranger and all this kind of stuff, uh, intrusion detection, network intrusion detection tools and firewalls, and they're getting swamped with these logs and what. The red team is all over them. The red team has their network penetrated. The, network, the red team is super user on, on their servers. The red team is every day taking their ATOs, ATOs, air tasking order, big piece of information, is taking it every day. And the blue team doesn't have a clue. The red team starts to give them clues, um, both, both by actions and also by controlling their displays. The blue team doesn't notice. The red team sticks a picture of Saddam Hussein on the, you know, on the big command display wall, the situation wall. The blue team looks at it and laughs. <laughs> they never knew. They don't take it seriously. I'll come back to this in a second. Um, and there's plenty of technology around already in the private sector and even in DOD, and also in DOD, which is not being used in the field. So you don't have to invent anything new to get better in this case. We said, what, what, were, our, what were our goals for, um, for C4I system security? The C4I system should remain operationally secure and available, even under attack. Doesn't ask, seem like too much to ask, does it? I convinced everybody that attack was easier than defense. Do I need to convince you? The defender is in the position in the interior, has to defend um, at 24 by 7 in all directions against every kind of uh, attack. The attacker is in the position in the exterior, he only has to, he gets to watch a long time, and he only has to succeed one time in one place in one way. Plus, he gets a medal and the defenders don't. We adopted these principles that there should be defense in depth. Cipernet. 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 Um, once you're in Cipernet, Cipernet is the secure IP router net. Right? It handles classified information, not super classified information, classified information, secret. And anyhow, um, it's, Cipernet is crisp and crunchy on the outside and soft and mushy on the inside. Once you're in Cipernet, you can go anywhere in Cipernet. And who's in Cipernet, by the way? Everybody, including coalition partners. And you may have studied, if you ever studied this kind of stuff, you may have learned that revocation of access is a very, very hard thing to do. I mean, it's maybe one of the open problems in computer security is revocation, effective revocation of access. Well, how do you kick out the guy who was in your coalition yesterday but isn't in it today um, or tomorrow? Things should degrade, de degrade gracefully. There is a tension between security and other system assets, attributes, there's no doubt about that. Security and, uh, and usability have long been at odds with one another. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, a lot of people won't do anything because they can't do what's perfect. They say, ah, oh, yes, but somebody could come in a mini sub and do this and that and have this kind of thing. And this, uh, this prevents people from taking any action at all. Plus which, the current defenses are passive, which means that we sit there and take them and we don't have a way to fight back in the information part of the battle space against the attackers. And so the attacker can attack all day and not pay a penalty for failed attacks. The attacker can run a war dialing attack against the, against the um, Atlantic Fleet's telephone exchange. And nobody will even notice that he's doing it, much less try to find out where the war dialing attack is coming. You know what war dialing is? Dial every number and listen for modems. And then when you get the modems, try to log in or try to see what kind of system is there. Um, that's a passive defense. So our recommendations were these. Oh, and in this case, the retired admirals and generals were superb because they knew who the recommendations should be, um, should be aimed at. We had no idea. And, you know, and they, for instance, told us, don't recommend that a new something be started. Or, you know, and, and say, aim this at that level, aim that at the other level, because they were fine-tuned to the kind of politics of the Pentagon. Um, so in this case, these guys should designate an organization responsible for providing direct defensive operational support to commanders. Defensive information operation support. So what do we see at Blue Flag? Here are these poor defenders sitting there in the red team, watching their net range of logs and getting overwhelmed and nobody's helping them. Up on the red team, on the other hand, 
right? There's NSA guys sitting at the elbow of the operators, and out in the out in the in the trailer, right? There was NSA guys in the intel cell helping those guys. Why is there no? Um, why is there no? Why was there no expert support to the defenders? Remember, we said defense was a harder job, but there is no expert support um, to the defenders. That was our number one uh, recommendation. Number two. Okay, sec def should be sure that everybody has the tools they need and that everybody's trained in the use of the tools and they get rewarded for using them right and that there are sanctions for using them wrong. So there has to be some kind of metrics about, um, about information security defense. I mean, the, the, the mission has to be properly staffed and equipped and then there are metrics and then there are consequences. Right now, there aren't many. Rec 3. SecDef, these guys and the commanders in chief. Aha, force on force. Eligible receiver was great because it demonstrated to people a failure. It demonstrated to people things they didn't want it to know. And it was, a, it was a wake up call, but now everybody's gone back to sleep. Many people have gone back to sleep again. Things have changed. I don't mean to say that it's totally black. Things have, things have changed. But um, uh, we kind of thought that that would be a useful thing um, to carry on doing. It's done in other areas of operations. I mean, this is the Department of Defense. You know, and, and, and the Department of Defense knows how to defend in many ways. Superb in, um, in, in, in physical defense, in air defense, in sea defense, and so on. Why should it not also be superb in information space defense? Okay, this is the recommendation that says, look, you don't have to invent, you don't necessarily have to invent new stuff here. There's existing stuff that you can take and use and it's going to make things better. This recommendation, number five, says, um, okay, um, not only should you take the stuff off the shelf to make things better, but you shouldn't stop trying to invent new stuff because you're in a different uh, you're, you're in a different vulnerability posture and you're facing a different threat than commercial operations uh, are facing. And the stuff that's off the shelf has largely been um, developed for help the defense of commercial operations. So that's where your research budget comes from, Cynthia. Okay. Here's what we discovered. This is about exercises. What we discovered time and time again, when the exercises that we observed and that we went back and asked people about and made phone calls about, is that a common practice in the Department of Defense is to tell the red teams, to tell the attackers who would be attacking the, the trainees, the exercise C4I systems, to lay off. They don't attack this hard because we have other pedagogic aims we want to meet here. And if you take down their system, we're never going to meet the exercise um, aims. And uh, while, of course, you have to, I mean, the exercise has to do what it's supposed to do, we think that part of what it's supposed, we, fe we recommended that part of what it's supposed to do is to test the C4I systems and the ability of, of the C4I systems to be defended. And the ability for the commanders or whoever being trained to carry on their mission and complete their mission even if their C4I systems are down, even if their C4I systems are penetrated. And it's somewhere in the text of the thing, it says that people should train at least part-time as if their C4I systems are penetrated and the only, thing, the only way they have to communicate is on secured voice, the commercial telephone system. Because now what happens, the system goes down, People go, ah, well, what happened in Granada is people went to the phone booth. Uh, cell phones hadn't been invented or weren't available there yet. So, I mean, people went to the phone booth and used commercial telephone system to call home. Um, and that became an important part of the C4I system. And that could happen, again, especially in, in operations other than war, in low-intensity in low kind of conflicts in urban environments where there's all these infrastructures built out and where there may not have been a lot of time to prepare the battlefield communications um, uh, communications assets. And now, 
here's the one that really put the cat amongst the canaries. And uh, this is a really risky one. But we, it's, that's why it's number seven. And in the, in the version of this briefing that was prepared and given uh, around the country, uh, this wasn't briefed. It's in the book, but it wasn't briefed. But I'll brief it to you. This says, and I'll, let's, let's read it. SecDef should take the lead in explaining the severe consequences for the U.S. military capabilities that arise from a purely passive defense of the C4I infrastructure and take the lead in exploring policy options to respond to these challenges. In other words, SecDef should raise, is recommended from us, should raise as an issue the difficulty of carrying out defense missions if the only defense of C4I that's allowed is passive defense. I mean, right now, an attack on a C4I system in time of peace in the U.S. is a law enforcement, um, is a law enforcement issue. Maybe, it, and, and, and it, perhaps it should be. I mean, there's, there's a reason, there's a reason why the military doesn't operate in law enforcement ways in the, in the United States. But it's a law enforcement issue, and the time around that loop is very, very, very long and deliberate. Because the purpose of the law enforcement is not to, is not to stop the attack, but rather to, to identify and catch and develop forensic evidence against and to prosecute and to convict the attackers. But the attacks happen very, very quickly. I mean, long before law enforcement gets called, the attack may have been and gone. And so it's, um, it seems like an inappropriate way um, to defend. Uh, a um, time? You looking nervous? No, no. Okay. So, um, so we would like the SecDef to start the discussion of this in policy, in policy circles in Washington. We're not saying it needs to change, but it's a situation that we find ourselves in that leaves us defending our systems with one hand um, tied behind our back. In the book is the example of a war, a war dialing example. Um, oh, and terrorists in, in trucks. So a terrorist comes with a bomb in the red truck and up to the gate of the base, and the sentries say, sorry, you can't come in with a bomb in a red truck. Go home. Uh, come back a yellow truck. Sorry, you can't come in in a yellow truck. And eventually tries a lot of different colored trucks, comes in an olive green truck. Say, oh yeah, you can come in with your bomb in the, uh, in the olive green truck. You allow it on the base, boom. Okay, what are the consequences then for the base commander? Probably significant and severe. I mean, also for the people who get boomed, they're significant and severe. But that's a physical space thing. It's very easy to see what's happened. So and now suppose you go to, um, to a war dialing scenario or say a password, uh, a password search, dictionary attack against password space. So a guy comes and tries phone number one, it doesn't work. Phone number two, it doesn't work. Phone number three, it doesn't work. Phone number four, it try all day long, all night long. Right? Finally finds one with a modem attached and gets to log in. Maybe he's logged in behind the firewall in the cipernet. And then he goes and, and does significant damage there. Consequences? Probably not any. Probably nobody's responsible. And probably even if somebody saw the attack happening, um, it's probably uh, would raise significant uh, difficulties of authority for taking military action against the attacker. Now, there are, technical, there are technical problems associated with that. In cyberspace, you don't know who is attacking you. You may identify the wrong person, or just the last node that was coming. And even if you can identify the person, you don't have a range of, of options in cyberspace to hit back. I mean, you do, but, and, you know, and there are some beginnings of rules of appropriate force that some commands are, are making. Um, but this business of appropriate force in cyberspace and authorities in cyberspace is unexplored and needs to be explored. That was number seven. What happened? Not much, I'm sorry to say. There's 2,000 copies of the report in circulation. Some agencies, particularly NSA, have taken the report and said, there's stuff in here we really need to know, and we're going to use this as a piece, as a foundation of work we need to do in our organization, culturally and politically and process-wise, interoperability-wise. 
and so on. Even in industry, the report is used as a guideline. Um, but in terms of the DOD, very little has happened. A number of briefings um, at the ASDCQ die level in the Pentagon was scheduled and then rescheduled and then rescheduled and maybe one was eventually given but people were changing the whole CQ, CQ die, C4I uh, part of the Pentagon uh, was changing the positions were vacant they were acting people of three or four levels deep um, there was nobody home to hear the report Congress had long gone away the congressional staffer who had put that in the Defense Appropriation Act of 1996 you know had gone off to work on somebody's campaign and so Congress was gone and nobody was home in the Pentagon so um, so everybody on the committee is out giving talks like the one I've just given you uh, in the hope that uh, maybe it's a general, generational thing and that somebody here will rise to a position of tremendous um, command authority and make something happen and also you know a hope that maybe the people who don't understand this information stuff will eventually retire and go away before they get burned by using it as heavily by using it as heavily as they are and becoming as dependent upon it um, as they are. So what's the value of finally of serving on an NRC committee? Um, because well you may get asked someday to serve on an NRC committee. Um, I think the value, it's, it's one of those things, it's something like an education, you know there's a, what do the economists call it, the consumption value of something? It's the value you get out of something by doing it. For instance, entertainment has a consumption value. It's, you get a value out of out of going to the ball game, you enjoy going there, but in the end, you don't walk out with anything that's valuable other than, than the experience. And a lot of education is, is like that um, as well, although you may walk out with a degree, which then you can turn into, um, in, into, into value in terms of op uh, uh, opportunities in your career or uh, opportunities for reimbursement. I think the value of serving on an NRC committee is very much the uh, consumption value alone. It's the opportunity to sit there in a room and work for three years on a hard problem with a bunch of very smart people, and then to come out with a report that you could be proud of, if, uh, even, even if the intended uh, audience doesn't read it. I'm going to leave two copies of this report here. I'll leave them with Professor Irvin, one's for her personally, and one's for her to do whatever else she likes with. There is a website in which you can read the report and download it if you have high enough bandwidth. And here are the URLs. So, um, so the slides are at this URL. Well, they're not, but they will be tomorrow morning um, at this URL. And this is one of the slides, so you don't have to write this one down. <laughs> but the report um, is at this URL. And with that, I think I'll stop here. And uh, there's not a lot of time left. But we started a little late, and I'd be happy to take your questions and comments. How do you, how do you propose having an active defense, and obviously the opposite of a passive, is being active, in light of all the you know, spoofing capabilities and how that very active defense can be used as a tool against yourself, um, other than doing a thorough scan of your own vulnerabilities and making that an active measure of defense, how can you be active in such a, you mentioned the fact that it's very difficult to tell what's coming at you, unlike a red truck or a yellow truck. That, that complication, how do you get over that, beyond that, to be confident enough to be active in your defense? It's a good question. It's the open question. I don't have the answer to that one, but I want the question on the agenda. You know, it's, a hard, it's a hard problem. Hard problems have a way of hitting back, um, but that doesn't mean you can't attack them. Any cryptanalyst knows that. Yeah. Um, doctor, do you per perceive the NMCI as um, a way to maybe facilitate getting our security act together, or maybe as a detriment because now the Navy Marine Corps are potentially putting all their eggs in one basket? I don't know anything about the NMCI. So I, yeah, and I, I can decode the I, yeah, okay, I can yeah. decode the acronym, yeah. but I really I, mean, I really don't know what's what do you think? Let me board. let me turn it around. What do you well, think I, about I, it? I kind of think I think <laughs> it, it goes both ways. It goes mm -hmm. both ways, but I think we see here um, it's a user issue. 
you know, making the user smart, people who are actually administrating or empowering them or changing the reward system, mm -hmm. what have you, elevating mm -hmm. this to the um, exposure it needs to be at. Um, if you maybe have everybody on the same system look, reading from the same sheet of music, if you will, mm -hmm. it might facilitate uh, an easier time of, of, of training up people to be more security conscious, be more aware of a configuration of a system and how different configuration changes, you know, can bite you if, if yeah. you don't watch out. And now, goodness, goodness knows how many C4I systems we have. Yeah, I mean, if you try to get everything, at least one configuration or something that you can kind of comprehend, it might make it easier to manage. That, yeah, so thanks that, for the that comment. Regard, it might, might outweigh the putting all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. Uh, all your eggs in one basket is never a great idea. But yet that's the argument that people seem to use against the, the whole concept. Yeah. Don't know about that. Others? Yes. I have two questions. One is, uh, did you make any specific recommendations for strong authentication mechanisms? And uh, two, I'll just say this quickly. Is I'm curious what the role of the white team was during that exercise. OK. So the first one is really easy to answer. The, the answer is yes. Um, you want to know which strong authentication <laughs> mechanisms? Well, certainly uh, one-time passwords. And then there was a big debate about biometrics. Um, and I think, and although the report devotes some space to them, uh, I think what happened is somebody on the committee probably owns stock in a biometrics company. And the white team's role, is, the white team serves as the referees. And they ruled on what was legal, what was illegal, illegal what assets had been um, destroyed, and what assets hadn't. So they were the referees. Other questions? Yes? Have things gotten worse with all of DOD going to Microsoft operating system? Oh, yeah. That's all eggs in one basket. So, I mean, that's, that's a number of issues. Um, that's, that's, there's, there's no way DOD is not going to run on COTS. So it's the, it's the COTS issue, the commercial off-the-shelf systems issue. And COTS, I mean, the security of Microsoft systems is very, very poor. It's not one of their goals um, that things should be secure. Um, uh, but they have a driver running against them, which are the Hollywood studios. And so things may get better um, in the operating system world, but better in a sense that it protects uh, movie contents for example. So our challenge is going to be to figure out how to use literal Mickey Mouse security um, uh, to secure multi-level classified data. We passed the high point in computer security sometime in the 70s. We didn't even know it. That's, that's my opinion. But yet, um, but yet those operating systems and the computers that they ran on are all gone. are all gone. So the question is, how do you build a secure system out of insecure components? Good question. Open question. Thesis or two in it, maybe even a Nobel Prize. Well, there'll, never <laughs> <laughs> there'll never be a Nobel Prize in mathematics but there, or computer science, uh, but maybe a Fields Medal. Yeah? just waiting to your probe to respond, or is, it a, is there any active role that could be taken, as far as you know, to uh, respond to people probing? So let me see if I understand the question. Do, so this is D, D, D do, I, know of, do I know of active defenses right. um, that could... Are there any recommendations you guys make? No, we didn't make, we didn't make recommendations of, of what to do. Um, we didn't make recommendations of what to do. We made recommendations and we said, structurally, this is a problem. Structurally, this is a problem and it needs to go on, get onto people's agendas, both in the, in the political sense and in the technical sense. I'm sorry, it's not a very satisfying answer, but yet this is early days. Right. Um, this is early days in that area. What was the response to this? Why, why the slide was removed? Why? It, it oh, posse comitatus. You know, people say, oh, you're going to loose the military on the U.S. civilian population. You know, we, uh... Well, it's, my theory is the handshake principle. If someone wants to shake your hand, you want to know who's shaking it, you know. That's a good idea. That's, that's a good idea. And, in fact, um, 
TCP connections are open with a three-way handshake. Right? But anyhow, that was, the, that was the gut response of a lot of people. They said, this one is too hot to handle. But um, there will be, in all likelihood, a National Research Council committee to study this very problem starting in 2001, probably in the, in the next fiscal year. Is. I won't be on it. I, I, <laughs> I won't be on it. You could do one of these every 10 years or something, but you know. One question that is outside your purview on this committee, but had to go with the DOD culture, if you don't mind me asking, were you privy to, to all the results on that, uh, all the discussions? Oh, yeah. The, uh, They're all in here. Because to many people in this room, there is a little bit of a push for DOD to come up with a specialty, an IT specialty, mm -hmm. you know, officers, so that we can maybe start driving this in the right direction and, and, and change a little bit of the DOD culture. Was there a specific recommendation in, in promoting that end? Recommendation P1, SecDef working with the serv service secretaries and s chairman of the Joint Chiefs should establish in each of the services a specialization in combat information operations, providing better professional career paths for C4I specialists, and emphasize the importance of information technology in the professional military education and DOD leadership. You know, you know, it may get more specific than that, but that was just the first one. Yeah, was there, am I ignoring this side of the room? Did I see a? What do you attribute, sir, the, uh, the fact that your report, you know, you finished your report, it was a three-year study, and no one was there to really listen mm -hmm. to it. Is it uh, based solely on the fact that we've really never been burned in the C4I, in your professional opinion, or what? I think that may be part of it. Um, I mean, people don't pay attention to communication security until you start showing them some SIGINT or comment take. 